I was preparing a message and I came across this scripture and it blew my mind. It like, like I read the Bible twice from front to back, um, in my life. And obviously I read scripture here and there, um, as I study the word, but the scripture blew my mind. It blew my mind because I'm like, wow, like I forgot that was there. And am I saying that for me or am I just, um, living this Christianity life, trying to seek comfort versus God's will for my life. And if you know anything about following God's will, sometimes comfort is not there. And the scripture that I want to talk about is Hebrews 11. And Hebrews 11, it talks about the hall of faith, right? All the the the, the generals, the 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 Noahs, the Davids, uh, the Abrahams, right? The Sarahs. Um, the Jacobs, it talks about these men and women that back in the day were able to put their faith in God. In fact, while they were being tortured and tormented, um, there's a scripture that says in, in Hebrews 11.35, the back part of Hebrews 11.35, it says this, There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. So you got to think, these are people that... Um, did not have Jesus here, right? They they had the scriptures taught to them, and and they believed in and hanging out and being with God and and, and uh, eternity with God and being one with God, and and they're awaiting that resurrection. They're awaiting to be with God because of great suffering. At the time that this was written, it was written when. Nero was in power. And if you know anything about Nero, he was bloodthirsty. He dipped Christians in oil and used them as light in the Colosseum or around the Colosseum. He had dogs chasing them. He had he wouldn't just do this to Christians. He would do this to everyone. But Christians were definitely targeted. And so he was this evil, evil man. And so this writer was trying to encourage the body of Christ in this time. So after you read Hebrews 11, it sets it up for Hebrews 12. It sets it up. It says, hey, here are the old followers of God and how they trusted God. They didn't have the Holy Spirit. They didn't have Jesus. They didn't have all those things. They trusted in God and they trusted in the teachings that they got from the rabbis and the stories that carried on from generation to generation from the Abrahams and the Moses and the Sarahs and obviously the Torah, right? And so now the, 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 the transition into chapter 12 is the encouragement to you. Here's the encouragement. Again, after reading that scripture, they did not want to be delivered from their suffering so that they can have a greater resurrection. That right there was sobering to me and my God, am I living that life? Am I saying, hey, don't deliver me from my suffering? Number one, if you live in America, there's very, very few suffering compared to what's happening all over the world. But in our suffering, are we saying, if this suffering is to advance the kingdom of God, if this suffering is to teach me something so that I can be a better light, then Lord, please do not remove the suffering. Are we praying that? But let's read on to 12, um, verse 1, chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that is easily entangled and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. The joy set before him when he had you in his mind. He says, God, God, forgive them for they not know what they do. When he endured the cross, he said, I see the joy of being with my body. I see the joy of of giving humanity a chance to repent, a chance for humanity to come together back into the adopted ones to be back into the kingdom of God, right? When he was seeing that, that's the joy set before him. He endured the cross. And so now let's go back to that sobering scripture that I read in Hebrews 11, the, the back part of verse 35. Are we preaching that? Are we saying that to God? Or are we rather just be comfortable in our walk? I know there's that prosperity gospel where, hey, come to Jesus. He's going to make everything fine. He's going to make you rich. He's going to do... No, these people got this story in the midst of suffering to encourage them to say, don't lose 
faith. Jesus suffered and he saw it as joy because he's living for the life to come. He's seeing the future. He knows what's going to happen. So for our benefit, he suffered. So are you saying the same thing? Are you suffering for Christ's sake? Are you sharing in the fellowship of his suffering to further the kingdom of God? Or do we want to just be comfortable? That ministered to me. I'm asking myself that same question. I'm looking at every area of my life and saying, Lord, am I comfortable in the area of life where you want me not to suffer like suffer sake? I'm talking about purposeful suffering. Here in America, is someone cussing you out. Here in America, is people gossiping of you. Here in America, it could be jail time, taking the stand to go to jail. There's people that went to jail in the middle of a pandemic because they didn't want to shut down. In America, is not the same kind of suffering that these Christians were dealing with. And so let this be an encouragement to you to fix your eyes on Christ, to fix your eyes on the life to come. Because when you fix your eyes for this life and you're trying to live for this life, you're going to miss it. You're going to miss what God has for you. And so hang in there. This life is hard. You're going to have moments of awesomeness and happiness and bless. And some moments are going to be hard. I think about John the Baptist. He prepared the way for Christ and he was in prison and he was like, oh my gosh, is Jesus really the Christ? Because I'm here in prison. I prepared the way for him and I'm in prison. He hasn't set me free. Are you really the Christ? Can you tell Jesus I'm in prison because I'm here and and this is not right. This is not my expectation of what it meant when I was trying to usher in the Messiah. And what did Jesus do? How did he reply? He didn't say, hey, you know what? Hang in there. I'm going to be over there. I'm going to break you free. No. He said, blessed are those who are not offended account of me. In other words, you did your part. You ushered me in. Thank you, John. And your reward will be in heaven. But you're going to die. And he sure did. His head got cut off in prison and served on a platter for following Christ. Not only following Christ, he baptized Christ and he prepared the way. You would think, wouldn't you treat him better, God? Wouldn't you like, like have a better death for him? If that doesn't offend you, that's a hard teaching. Who's saying that? Hey, you can follow Christ, but man, your head might be cut off. You might get persecuted. You may not make it to your old age. You might get thrown in prison. You might get beat up. You might whatever, fill in the blank. Are we really preaching that? Or are we preaching, hey, when you become Christians, everything's going to be great. You're going to have your cup of coffee on Sundays, enjoy a good sermon, good worship, and go home and just say Jesus loves you and everything's going to be okay. That's not what Hebrews 11 was talking about or Hebrews 12. That's not what John the Baptist experienced. That's not what 11 out of the 12 disciples experienced. And so the encouragement is have faith and fix your eyes on the life to come. Because if you fix your life in this age, you'll be disappointed. And I feel like a lot of people leave Christianity because they had the wrong perspective, that they were told the wrong gospel, that they said that everything's going to be a OK if you follow Christ. And that's not true. You'll have peace within. You'll have the peace that surpasses all understanding. You'll get to experience blessings and things that are good, but you're also going to experience things that are hard. John the Baptist experienced something hard. And Jesus said, go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight. The lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised. And the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Or in other verses, who are offended. What Jesus was saying is, your part of the mission is done. Thank you. And look what all is happening because of your obedience and because of your yes. And I promise you, I'm preparing a place for you in heaven. I'm preparing a place for you in the life to come. And you have to fix your eyes on the life to come. Because when you fix your eyes on earth, then you've missed it. That's the gospel message. It's when you surrender it all to Christ. When you say yes to Jesus, it might be difficult. Are you going to stand offended? 
or are you going to look at all that God's done in your life through the suffering, furthering the kingdom of God, leading more and more people to Christ? Is that worth it to you? Is that worth it? Are you saying the same thing Jesus said? For the joy set before me, I endure the cross. Are you saying, do not deliver me from this suffering so that my resurrection could be greater? This message is preaching to myself. I'm not casting stones. I'm not pointing fingers. That's hard. It's hard. I'm tired of seeing the gospel message out there. Talk about prosperity. Talk about abundance. Talk about all these things that, yeah, that could happen. But what's your mission? What is it that God has you here for? Everyone has a mission. And when we start thinking that everyone's going to be successful and have a lot of money and all these things, then we've missed it. Then we've missed it. So stand in courage. Thank you for your suffering. Don't suffer for suffering's sake. Suffer because you're preaching the good news of the gospel. And the good news is in the life to come, we will be once again in the garden with our mighty God. And that's the good news. Aloha.